Hello, it's Jason Payne for Cold Banker, Dan Harper Realtors. Well, today I'm at Bell Oaks at the Casa de Main model home, and this is gonna be a unique video. It's gonna be kind of a long one, but we have Chris Kerr with Legacy Mutual. He's gonna go step by step what the lending process is for building a custom home. We've also got Ryder Rodriguez. He's the sales rep for Casa de Main. He's gonna tell you a little bit about Casa de Main homes. And we have the design team going through like three different phases of designing a home between uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional and the finalized steps. They do some amazing work and it's especially that 3D version being able to show you what the house is going to look like before you even get it uh, plans finalized. Anyways, I'm excited about this video. I have a feeling it's going to be a long one so please bear with it. Some amazing information and there's going to be a bunch of people in here so I can't it's not geared toward doing a YouTube video, but I'm gonna do the best I can to video it to get you the most information as possible. So all right, let's go check it out. The requirements for custom construction, whether this is your first build or you've done this a dozen times, I mean, um, it's the industry's always evolving. Um, you know, we've worked with some very quality folks over the course of the last, you know, 25 years. You know, Brent, our owner operator, is out of the Bernie area, so he's been in this industry through it all. You know, we're talking 2008, 2009, up until now, we've seen the ebb and flow of things and and understand how these markets work. Um, you know, the goal for today is. Um, to talk obviously uh, about where we stand um, as far as lending goes and the understanding of how that works for 2023 first quarter second quarter and where you know Chris and I you know, potentially see this things things going as we hop into this election year um, so you know part of our dedication to our craft is making sure that we you know we couple with um, outstanding subcontractors, outstanding lenders, you know, realtors. I have some, some wonderful realtors we work with, Jason Payne, the whole team over at Magnolia Realty. I mean, it's, uh, I've been really blessed to, uh, to have this opportunity and, and um, I enjoy what I do. Absolutely love it. So um, when we're talking new construction, you know, it's, it's the more you know, the more prepared you are, the better off you'll be, the better experience you'll have. Because um, there's a lot that really does go into construction. So, um, you know, another thing we're going to go over today is uh, I have Adam and Sergio from Distinctive Design. Um, they are absolutely amazing when it comes to helping realize what the potential is for your potential home, right? So, um, you know, a lot of folks will walk a house or see a home on, on a plat or a plan and, and it's two dimensional and it, it's hard to really grasp that. Uh, the the beauty of what they do is they do some really outstanding three-dimensional renderings. They've done, they literally design all of my homes just because I'm so confident in their power and their ability. And then we'll get on Zoom meetings and really handcraft these things as we proceed. So you're a part of the design as well. We'll go over today some of the stuff that they've created for us over the course of the last year and a half and they'll show you all that and how it essentially works. And then like we know, Chris is going to start us off here and kind of dive into the current state of the market and then uh, where we see things going. So at any time, if you have any questions feel free to holler um, everybody will also be available after the meeting if you want to get more detailed into um, you know your specific needs moving forward so I want to say we're getting really close here um, maybe yeah no. no? Okay. There you go. All right. All right. You can do, it's input one. If it finishes, it's up there. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, so I'll hand it over for Chris to Chris for now. And then from there, Adam and Sergio will take over and, and dive into the whole design aspect of things. So I'm still ready. You want to be green, right? You turn yours off. Oh, is that Jason's? Yeah. Hey, turn your other one off, Ryder. Right? Well, good afternoon. Again, Chris Kerr, Legacy Mutual Mortgage. I am a local lender. I live just north of here, Spring Branch. We've got office in New Braunfels in San Antonio as well. But we are, home office is based out of San Antonio. So we are local. Been here over 20 years. My wife's from San Antonio. So I ended up back here in the Texas market um, for sure. So I'm open to any questions you all have. I've got some information I was going to run through as far as the process, what the process looks like from a lending standpoint. I'm happy to talk about the five, the uh, economics of today uh, and what we think we are going to see going forward because that's obviously a big question. We were just visiting about that in the kitchen on what the economic outlook has, right? So there's been a lot of news in the last week with the banks, Silicon Valley Bank, right? Some other regional bank issues. And so um, that's shifted our market a little bit in rates. We came down about a half a point in perm rates, in purchase rates, and permanent rates just in the last seven days. 
Um, so that's how quick things change, because over the 30 days prior to that, we had seen over a half a point increase uh, in that 30 days. So rates are always on the move, ebb and flow up and down, uh, always on the move. So question, and I'll start with economics because I can't obviously go through the process. So uh, as you all know, we've seen rates increase over the last 12 months from December of 21, around uh, mid threes, to the end of the year current, not this week, but two weeks ago into the mid sevens is as high as we've hit, right? If you've bought a home outside the last five years, that's not so scary. Unfortunately, people have short memories. And so lots of people only remember twos and threes, right, from 2021. And so rates did come back down. They're in the mid sixes, mid to high sixes. This is all perm stuff, right? This is not construction lending. That's a different discussion, different rates. Um, but we can talk about that as well. But longer term, when you're looking at finishing construction, because none of you have started construction, so you're 12 to 18 months out, essentially, at a minimum, give or take, um, we do expect rates to come down. There are already people putting in writing that rates will be down by the end of the year. And they're putting in writing into the fives. I think that's super aggressive at the end of the day, um, but there is a chance we could be in the high fives by the end of the year. I do think we'll be headed south. Now, the banking debacle that happened starting Monday last week, Silicon Valley Bank, right? They were showing a, a gain on their books when they actually had a $3 billion loss on their books, right? I won't get into the deep details of it, but overall they basically became insoluble. People came in and they started pulling their money out of that bank. 93% of the investors, depositors in that bank had over the $250,000 FDIC limit, right? So that's a very niche bank, very niche in what they invested in. Of course, the Fed stepped in and said, we're gonna cover all that money, even if you had $5 million in the bank, which is not the way the rules row, you know, show, but that's what they did, right? So they're pumping money into the economy. What creates inflation? Putting money into the economy. Too much money chasing too few goods, right? So that's what builds inflation. So the Fed's goal is to decrease inflation by doing that, they want to increase unemployment, right? But unemployment stayed strong, or unemployment has stayed super, super strong. And so that's been the battle that they continue to fight because people continue to spend, right? So that's, the, that's where we are today, right? Do we think it's gonna be contagious and go into lots of other banks? I don't think it's gonna be a huge regional issue. Um, there is some potential that we saw some other regional banks get bailed out last week by the bigger banks, right? $30 billion at one of them. And so there is that potential. I just don't see that gonna, my opinion is that that will continue long term. I do think the Fed, when they meet next week, they're still gonna raise rates. Um, probably another quarter point. Now they raise the federal funds rate. That's different than mortgage rates. Mortgage rates follow the 10 year treasury which is the which mortgage backed securities follow. So that's what interest rates follow. But banks follow federal funds rate because that's the rate at which the government loans money to banks at, right? So as that has gone up, what we have seen go up is the construction cost, interim construction financing. That rate has gone up, right? From when we were in the sixes to now you're in the mid to high eights for that. Now keep in mind that's a short term loan, interest only on the draws, and so we'll, we can talk about how that looks in detail, but those rates do follow directly what the federal funds rate does. And so, um, but long-term outlook is a uh, one, rider, please. Uh, long-term, it should be under HTML one. Um, long-term outlook is that rates will come back down starting the latter part of this year. Depends on whether we have a hard recession or a soft recession. Depends on how fast and, and how furious those things happen, right? So I'll cover a slide here in a second that um, we'll have, I'm blind, that's what I get, see? Uh, PC duplicate. If you've got economics questions, we can talk to those now. I'm gonna run through this, stop me at any point in time, we can hit it at the end. Once again, if you've got questions, we'll roll through it. So this is about the process, right? To get from here, which is when you're in design phase, to a finished home on the right. That's the goal, right? So pre-construction, what happens? There's a couple of things that happen up front. Some of you already have your lot, right? And then you're gonna find a builder. Some people are gonna have a builder, then they're gonna find the lot. 
Usually you find your lot and then you start talking to builders. Here's the advantage or the difference if you do it the other way around, is if you've talked to Ryder and you've gone through that conversation and you know what your budget is, now Ryder can go out and walk those lots you're looking at with you because what happens quite often is somebody comes in with a specific budget, then they buy a lot that has terrain or topography that now adds fifty dollars to $100,000 to their slab. Right, and so everything gets more expensive in those situations. So you can run either way with that, um, but if you haven't bought land, uh, I, th I know two of you at least have, I think all three of you may have. So, um, but that's still gonna happen with Ryder. Loan approval meeting. So usually what happens on that process is we have a conversation, right? You're starting to sit down, go through plans with Ryder, what you're looking at as far as budget goes um, in your mind and what that looks like for Ryder. Usually at that point is when I get involved and have a conversation, right? And it's a conversation much like what we're going to talk about without the slides. Um, but what does that process look like, right? What does down payment look like? What does loan to values look like? You know, what does permanent look like? How's that overall process goes? So we have that uh, meeting and I'm going to touch on what all of those pieces look like. You sign your initial contract with Ryder, start your design pick your selections and finalize your pricing. So that process can take as, as fast or as long as you want it to essentially, right? Because you're gonna put in an initial plan, you are gonna sit down with Ryder, you're gonna talk through that, you're gonna have discussion on shifting this wall, adding this square footage, reducing square footage, whatever that is, and then you're gonna put that back, he's gonna send it back, go through those iterations until you get to a final plan. Right before or right when we get that final plan is when we go in and we actually do the construction financing. Construction financing looks like through a local bank. I partner with a local bank right here in Spring Branch. Uh, they do all of my construction financing with Ryder um, for Casa Domain um, because they know the process. We all know the process. Ryder knows when they send a draw request over, 24 hours later that money's showing up after you approve it. Draws are done after the work is done. So when the work's completed, Casa Domain sends that draw request. The bank inspects, not inspects, the bank verifies the work is done and then turn around and send that money back to, the, to Casa Domain, right? So everybody, and you sign off on it before the bank does that. But that's super important because builders, obviously, when they finish their work, they want to get paid, right? And so that's super key for us on that. So that's pre-construction. Loan approval. So this is where we start working on what is that process. So once we talk about the process, which is interim construction loan, when we're about 60 days from permanent loan, we do um, is when we start looking at the permanent financing. Is that better? Is this you want these lights off? Oh, we're good. Just those, okay. We start about 60 days out from completion is when we start looking at permanent financing, okay? The process, documentation, qualifications are the same in both. So construction financing, we're looking at loan to value, typically up to 45%, not loan to value, sorry, debt to income ratios, up to 45%. If it's military, we'll do up to 50%, right? If you're doing a VA loan, 15% down minimum. If you're doing a VA loan, if I'm doing a VA loan at the end, then we'll do 10% down on the construction loan, minimum, right? These are minimum numbers. You can obviously bring a whole lot more if you so choose, but those are the minimums that we'll do on those processes. So we go through, we look at the down payment, we collect all, if you've bought a home, and I sure everybody in here has bought a home at some point, it's income docs, it's asset docs, right? We're proving all that information for loan approval. Once we go into the and a question we get a lot is, how are you gonna do an appraisal? I don't have a home, right? I'll have a set of plans. So those are called construction appraisals. So we'll take all your plans, your specs, your budget, everything you've got, that goes to the appraiser. The appraiser then turns around, looks at all that information based upon current market and what your build's gonna be, and sends us an appraisal back, right? It's just dirt, but that's how the out appraisal works. And then that financing number is based upon the lower of appraisal or cost at 85% loan to value or 15% down. Does that make sense? Everybody good with that? Okay, so once we get that, we go to close. That uh, interim financing timeline's about 30 days. 
So once now we will start when riders like, hey Chris, we've just sent it back for final pricing. Everything looks good. We're two weeks out on that. We'll go ahead and start the process for uh, the interim financing, collecting your docs, pulling credit, looking at all the numbers. And then that way when we get the final signed contract, all we've got to do is get the construction, the, uh, the uh, appraisal, and then we can close two weeks later. So it's not that much because once you all get to that point, you're ready to start. I assure you, you're ready to start, right? And so we don't want to delay you on our side. Loan documents are sent to a title company just like in a purchase agreement. It looks the same way. Construction loan, all uh, right. So if you've got a loan on your land right now, when, you, when we close on the construction loan, the very first draw pays off the land loan and that rolls into the construction loan. Construction loan is interest only payments on your draw okay so if you're putting this just for easy round numbers we're going to use a million dollars you're putting 50 percent down you're putting 500,000 down you're taking a $500,000 loan right just easy round numbers we will use your $500,000 first then we will step into the loan process and pull the 500,000 for the second half for completion of the home so what that does is you're not going to have any payments until we start drawing on the construction loan because we're using your money first, right? So no zero, 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 zero over 12 months, you may not have your first draw payment until six or seven months into the process. Five, six, seven months, right? And then at that point, if they draw $100,000 out and for easy round numbers, interest rates 9%, just because I just did this in my head the other day, that's a $750 interest payment that month. The next month, if they haven't drawn any more money in the process, you make a $750 payment that month. Now, if they do another $100,000 that month, now your next month's payment is $1,500, right? So you go up through that until you've drawn out your, in that situation, your $500,000. So um, that would be $3,750, if my math's right, um, for that one month. And then we're going to go to PERM, right, uh, and roll you into your permanent financing. So that's how payments work on that process. Uh, yep, yep, yep. I just talked about all that. So any questions on financing from the construction standpoint? All makes sense. Permanent. So we treat, and there's a group of questions at the end of this, and I'll go into some more detail on that. So when we go to PERM, we do everything that we do is a two-time close. And I'll talk about the difference here in a second. But when we go to PERM, we treat that permanent loan as a refinance. Meaning, if you've ever refinanced a house, you don't have to bring money to the table. We can roll in any costs that you've got. We can roll those in. Um, but it's treated as a refinance. So you're locking at 60 days out or less is when you lock rate on that permanent loan. In our current environment, that's a benefit in my opinion at this point because we expect rates to go down the next 12 to 18, I'll say 12 to 36 to be conservative, uh, months. We expect rates to come down, right? So if you're not locking out 12 to 36 months, well, you wouldn't build, in, but 12 to 18 months from now, you're gonna be in a better position than what you could lock today, okay? So we're gonna go in, we're gonna update any documents that we need to for the permanent loan. So that's typically gonna be maybe W-2s, maybe uh, pay stubs. Uh, maybe bank statements. Just depends on your situation personally. We're going to go in, look at all that. We're going to order a new appraisal as well. So here's the thing. If we look back over the last uh, 82 years, 74 of those years, homes have appreciated in value. Seven years, they have dropped in value, and one year was a tie. Five of those seven decreases was 07 to 2011. Right? And we all remember what happened then. That was a mortgage crisis. That was not an economic crisis. That was a pure mortgage crisis, right? We created that problem uh, in the world um, by giving people money that probably shouldn't have had money with no money down and no money out of pocket and da 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 da, da. Right? So that, um, we order that new appraisal and so we get any appreciation that happens over that time frame from when we started to when we close. So if it went up 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, you get that advantage. The advantage on that is, is it may help you loan to value wise because from an interest rate standpoint, interest rates vary based upon loan to value, they're based on credit score, they're based on loan size, or based on loan type, 
So there's lots of factors, but a, if you're at a 65% loan to value, that's a slightly higher rate than a 60% loan to value. 60 is a break point. It's just that it's easy number, but 60 is one of those break points. So there's advantages to having that equity built in over time that we can use uh, on that final appraisal. Then we go to closing just like normal. It's then a 15 to 30 year fixed mortgage just like every other home you've purchased in your life. You've probably had some arms if you've purchased more than one, um, but 15 to 30 year fixed mortgage at that point in time. So that looks just like a normal process though at the end. Questions on that? No one's stepping out on the questions. Okay. Well, let me ask myself some questions. So does equity in my land count towards my construction loan down payment? Yes. If you paid cash for your lot, that goes towards your 15% minimum down payment when we look at the build cost plus the land cost. So if build's a million for an easy round number and the land's 250, I don't know if I can do that math in my head. Um, I can't. Uh, but, you know, that's 1.25 million, right? Total cost. We need 15% of that. That's going to be about $29,000, if I'm right on that. It may not be, but I'm close. Um, no, because it would be twenty-five, dollars so it would be 20000 give or take on that. Um, that's what you're going to need for that 15000 No, that 15%. No, 190000 Goodness gracious, my math is off today. I'm usually good with numbers, but not today. So, because um, twenty percent of a million would be two hundred thousand, right? So fifteen percent of one point two five would be one hundred ninety thousand. Um, so we're going to use that towards your fifteen percent down. If you paid two hundred thousand dollars for your land, then technically you've covered all that, right? Now, Ryder in their contract, they're going to do a five percent down at initial contract and then a 5% down at final contract, right? So that's 10%. So if you don't have your full equity, either way, you're gonna have 10% paid to Ryder and Casa de Maine throughout that process, okay? And so most people that we deal with aren't bringing minimum money to the table, 10 or 15%, right? They're bringing more than that. And so we can work on those numbers depending upon your individual situation on how we work that minimum 10 or 15% out of pocket and there's some strategies I use when we start talking about financing um, to make sure you keep money back if you're not doing minimum. If you've owned your land over 12 months then we actually use appraised value of that land not cost. Okay so if the home if your land's appreciated you've owned it two years and the homes you know lands appreciated over time you get that benefit towards your loan to value. If my land's free and clear, do I have to put any much additional money down? We just talked through that, right? Depends on how much you've got in that versus do you not. Do I have to own my land for a certain amount of time before using as equity? No. If it's over 12 months, we use market value. If it's under 12 months, we use actual cost. Okay. Expected timeline for the process. So it's getting better. I can tell you that for sure. Um, timeline on build is getting better, right? Our timeline, about 30 days, like I said, for the, pro for the upfront interim financing, we'd like to start 45 to 60 days from close on the permanent, right? But in between there, depends on your timeline, how long you want to spend um, getting your plans put together, getting your stuff set up, and when you're ready to go, right? And then build time right now, it's gotten really good. I mean, my last few projects, per our contract, we always say, look, we're going to be 330 days from poor, pending any, you know, drastic events that might happen, be it whatever, COVID or, you know, that's just a good scenario to point to. But that being said, my last four had finished in about 10 months. I have one, two scheduled right now that are going to finish in about a nine month run. So we understand things are starting to be more consistent. Labor's consistent, materials are readily available. So all things considered, getting a very custom home done in under a year is awesome. It's where we should be and uh, moving forward. That's what we think we're going to go. Continue to stay on that trend. Because everything right now, I mean, right now we're seeing, you know, slabs poured in under 30 days, which is absolutely incredible. I mean, we'll look at a home today that Sergio and Adam have developed and I mean, we're two months into it and we're already uh, driving home in. So OSB's going on, roofs, you know, been framed and it's, it's pretty incredible. So yeah, time frame has gotten really, really good, which is awesome. For sure, for sure. 
Deposits to builder credited to my loan. So I told you about that 10%, right? Five and five. We do use that towards your minimum investment towards the loan to meet that 10% down or that 15% down, depending upon um, your personal situation. Those are minimums. You can always bring more money, obviously, to the table. I already talked about the appraisal. Man, I covered all my questions when I went through the first part. So no dirt in house. All right, should I always ask for a one-time close? Aren't two-time closings more expensive than one? So this is a regular question I get. I will tell you, the closing cost difference between a one-time close and a two-time close are probably $1,000 between the two different. There is not a lot of difference between the two. The one advantage of a one-time close, you lock your rate today. Anybody want to lock a 7% rate for the next 12 to 18 months? Correct, but 12 months ago, Scenario. Pretty good situation, right? So that's the advantage of a one-time close is you lock it, you know what it is, you're done, you don't have to worry about it, you're not, you're not subject to the market. But we do two-time close. That's the process I just walked through. Interim contract goes through the bank, local bank that I partner with here, uh, and then the permanent I do at the end for that fixed 15 to 30 VA or conventional mortgage, whichever works best for you, uh, and we do that. The advantage of a two-time close are many. So lots of times people have homes they live in today that they don't want to sell until they get to the end of building their new home. And they want to use the equity out of the current home on the new home. So in a two-time close, you have the advantage of we can work that or you can even potentially move into your home, your new one, while the old one's closing or selling. And then when you sell that home, on a two-time close, we can take whatever money you want, roll it into the permanent, bring that mortgage down, and you've got that permanent mortgage where you want it long-term, okay? It also, and you can't do that at one time. One time, once you pulled the money out, the money's out. Now, there's potential for a recast, but it depends on who that is, right? On who the investor is, on whether they'll let you do that or not. So two-time close, we also can, we'll extend, right? We've done modifications, so in some other individuals, um, not Ryder, but some folks out of Wimberley, um, we've had to increase the loan amount, right? They didn't want to come out of pocket for the difference, but we had the ability to come out of pocket and, and modify the loan. In a two-time close, we can go in, modify it, raise it up, use that money instead of coming out of pocket. Um, so two-time close, in my opinion, has lots of advantages. We get the appraisal advantage where we get to go back in, do the appraisal, or get that additional equity, right? Um, and so... And you've got lots of time, right? Lots of people come in, they're getting bonuses. Now I want to bring my bonus in, right? I want to use my bonus to go towards that. Um, different situation financially where they may or may not want to bring extra money. But that's the big piece is the flexibility for us and for you in that situation. Can I just use you, build it, and save myself a bunch of money? So I have uh, owned nine homes in 25 years. I've built two from the sticks up, two from the sticks, or two from the ground up, two from the sticks in. I will tell you it's a huge process to build this house uh, every time. And if you've ever dealt with a contractor for anything at your house, they may tell you they're coming today and they may be there next week, right? Uh, it is a huge undertaking to build a home to this magnitude. The other thing, you know, you build it will tell you it may be cheaper and that's just one of the many out there, right? But they have no accountability to you. That contractor has no accountability to you. They have accountability to Ryder and Casa de Maine because they use them for every home. And they use them on this home, and they'll use them on the next home, and they'll use them on the next home. So if they don't do what they're supposed to do, they've got a lot to lose from that standpoint, right? They're not employees, but they are contractors that have a lot to lose by not building Casa de Maine homes. And so while you technically may pay, and I, I, I would argue whether you actually pay much more when you actually go through the time and the, and the work to do that, um, you, you give up a lot as far as finish, as far as quality, and as far as if something goes wrong, they're not coming back, right? I mean, those contractors, that's just the way they work. They're moving on to the next job. What are the terms of construction loan? It's 12 months normally, interest only for that 12 months. There was a time, not very long ago, that we would extend those four months to 16 months so we can make sure we get them done. It's like a $350 fee to extend them. It's not a major cost to extend it, but that is the ability to extend those if we had to. But a normal construction loan, 12 months is how long they work. How do change orders work? So 
Change order in its simple form is, you want to make a change to a house that's not in the original plan, it comes with a cost to the builder, the builder passes on that cost to you, right? And those are typically paid with a check at that point in time, okay? So if you want to change these doors and you want to go bigger, taller, whatever, and that added $5,000, Right, they're going to send you a change order and you're going to write a check for $5,000. Okay, so that happens throughout the process. It just does because even building four homes in my life, I still don't like my house that I'm in the way I wish it was built. Right, I still wish I'd have done something else. And my wife tells me, I told you we should have done that. Right, so um, I've heard that once or twice lately, still, and we've been in it six years. Um, but you're still going to have things as while it looks good on paper, it may still be different or add plugs or changes, right? So those are change orders. So one thing that I do when we're having that conversation for interim construction is same easy conversation. It's a million dollar cost. You're bringing a half a million to the table. What I'm going to tell you to do is hold 10% of your cash back. So instead of taking a $500,000 loan, we take a $600,000 interim construction loan. Instead of bringing 500 cash, we bring 400 cash. So essentially, you've got $100,000 in your hand, right? To pay for change orders, to change, to buy, to do whatever it is you may want to do. Because here's the conversation I have several times, unfortunately, is, hey, I spent $50,000 more than I wanted to spend. Can I get that money back from you? The answer is yes, we can now do a cash out refinance. Oh, by the way, that costs more in interest rate, which means you pay on it longer over time. So the way I get around that is, let's just hold that 10% back. If you don't use it, when we get to the permanent, bring it at closing at the end, bring your mortgage back down. It's no big deal, it's no loss. Only if you need it, you've got it. If you don't need it, then you bring it at the end, you still put it towards the build, and we're all done. But it avoids the question and the stress of I wish I had or I didn't have or I spent this because those do happen. Change orders are going to happen in the process. I've never seen one not happen. Yeah, and they're not always negative. You know, the stigma associated with the change order is, oh my gosh, it's going to cost me money. Not always the case. A lot of times there's supply issues, availability issues, or, you know, maybe there's something you, you decided to increase or decrease or whatever it might be. You will always see a, change, see a change order, but it's not always a negative thing. It's not always a cost type of scenario. So. Yeah, it's just a tracking device to say it was X, now it's Y. So it may, I mean, it may be credit at the end yeah, of the day, depending upon what you're doing, it could be a credit yeah, back absolutely. to you, right? If you're taking this out and just want a, an easy slider, right? That's going to be a credit because those doors are much more expensive. Yeah. Or if you had a 16 foot slider and you've seen your space now, you're like, yeah. it's too big, I want to go down to a 12. Obviously the cost associated with the 12080 as opposed to a 16080 is very significant. So that would be a credit to you. Right, right. Should I put all my cash down up front? Well, I already covered that. So, mm -hmm. um, so I would not. I would always keep a 10% is what I always recommend holding back until you get to the end because you can always bring it at the end, but you may not have it if you don't. I mean, if, you're, if that's all your money, you're bringing all your money to the table up front, I always want you to hold 10% back. So questions, obviously that's the goal to get you into this cost of domain home. That's one of them right there. So um, questions on any of that? Build process, economics, builder, <laughs> any of it. Quiet group, I know I'm not that good, I swear. <laughs> so that questions, is. thoughts? Anybody built a house before from the ground up? Okay, so a few of you. For the people who are watching this online right now after the fact, feel free to leave your questions in the comment box. And uh, Mr. Chris Kerr here will be happy to answer those as well. Did you have a question? No. No questions? Easy. You got off the hook. Easy, buddy. Oh, well, I'll be here. If you have questions one-on-one, -on -one, I'm happy to have those conversations. All right. So you're turning awesome. it over. Yep. Perfect. Yes. So thank you, Chris. That's great. Um, so as we see a very good visitization of the home before it's even built. And that's what we're going to be describing we're going to be summing up our three steps that we take and then as we go through the three steps we'll also pause and answer any questions you may have uh, through what that process involves and what uh, how we get the pricing so that way at that point we will let you know how we, we guide the client from start to finish we'll start with phase one and we may not we're going to be taking turns between the phases as well so our phase one 
is kind of what you're seeing right here. We do start in a 2D concept because it makes it easier for us to be able to adjust a floor plan in 2D. Um, like I mentioned, we do go to 3D, but the first phase, 2D, because it allows us to modify the layout. Now, phase one is mainly focused to make sure that we get the location of the rooms where you want. So the first meeting, we'll be sitting down with you. We're able to go over that wish list that you may have, square footage, the amount of bedrooms you're wanting, where we want those rooms to be located. And then one of the main things that we want to go over is the property because property, especially in this area, is never flat. We have to worry about certain terrain issues regarding topography, certain drops. If there's certain trees, like for example, in this subdivision, there's lots of beautiful trees and some of the clients want us to design around certain trees. So in this case, if you notice, we're able to obtain a tree survey if possible. Uh, if not, we'll get our topography in there. And the topography there allows us to know exactly where the drops are going to be located at. Again, this is all already thinking about cost. If we push the house too far back or too much to the side where there's a drop, we might have a lot of exposure on the concrete. That's an increase, co that's an increase in construction cost. So at that point, we start looking at those issues right off the bat. Because again, we want to make sure that we start with that foundation of where the house is going to be placed from the very beginning. So in our initial concept meeting, Again, we go over the property, the, the way the house is going to be located on the property. We go over the floor plan and square footages. Now, one thing that we're able to uh, allow our clients to fully visualize the process is that we do things a little different from other firms. Some firms typically just take down notes and other meetings and they're like, okay, we'll get back to you in about a week with some of these changes. And that sometimes makes it kind of hard for the client to fully visualize the amount of changes, or we might get a certain change that the client wants to do, but like I like to call it and describe it, it could cause a domino effect on the opposite side of the house. So for example, let's say we're redesigning the kitchen, and I want to reduce 50 square feet, for example. Like, oh, well, it's cut off from this section, it's cut off from the bedroom. Well, then that might end up happening, what might end up happening is that it might cause a ripple effect on the opposite side of the house. It might cause the increase on the square footage because now the hallway going to the bedroom doesn't work anymore. That's just an example. So what we do is our first initial meeting is the only meeting that we take down notes because we're starting from scratch. But from there on out, all the meetings that we do, we do all the, cha all the changes real time. That way we're able to get the client to under explain why certain things will work and why certain things will not work. One thing that we're really against, of, against doing is saying no, and that's it, because a no doesn't really explain why a certain section will work, or better yet, what we could do to modify that plan to either reduce the square footage, uh, because that's the whole goal. Get you everything you're wanting at the lowest square feet as possible. So in those real-time meetings, we're able to do those adjustments in real-time, modify the plans, so that way at the end of the meeting, instead of you all waiting for us to get back with you on changes, we've already presented those changes to you during that meeting. That allowed us to be able to explain why certain things work, like I mentioned, what things will work, and also allows us to be able to give you a good idea of different options, because that's all it is. Uh, we we uh, explain to our clients at the beginning that all the houses that we design, we're treating them like if they were our own. So at that point, we're not gonna hold back from maybe giving you suggestions, but at the end of the day, we tell you all, you're the boss. So we're never gonna force our opinions, our suggestions on any of the clients, but that's what, you're, that's what we're there for, to give you guidance based on our experience in the design field. So at the end of the day, when we're done with our phase one, we're able to send you real-time changes, like I said, at the end of those meetings, and we're able to email you those to you so we can get your approval. One of the things if you notice here, we don't necessarily design the exterior right off the bat because at that point we're modifying heavily the design at the beginning. So if we were to design the outside and we do changes to the layout, that's already changing the roof plan, it's changing the exterior. So the last thing we wanna do is give you something that presents you something at the beginning like, well, now it's totally different. We wanna make sure that we're consistent. So as we're developing the plan, 
the plant becomes more and more whole as we develop and we process through those phases. So we do discuss heavily the, the exterior and phase one meeting at the very beginning. So if, for example, the last thing we want to do is design you a, uh, a proposed modern house when you're looking for a farmhouse. So we keep that in mind from the very beginning as we do the modifications. And as we're doing changes, we will bring those things up to you. Like, well, we do this wall here, or we extend it, that's gonna change the concept that we have for the exterior. So we're really good about always speaking out and giving you that guidance. But basically, like I mentioned, at the end of phase one that we're showing you right here, this example, uh, once we already have the locations of the rooms, we've already fine-tuned the square footage that you wanna be at, we've already placed a house, wherever you want it on the property, we go ahead and get this approval from you all, and then that gives us the guidance to move on to phase two. And that's when it becomes more realistic. That's when we start doing the, the actual 3D model. So instead of seeing that 3D model at the end, we go in right off the bat as soon as we get this approved. So that's basically in a nutshell, our phase one process at that point. We're gonna go to phase two right now, but were there any questions regarding our, our phase one and what's involved or or uh, what changes are, are involved in there? No? Are those change meetings done only face-to-face -face or do we have virtual capability? That's a very good question. So at that point, we could do either one. We could do face-to-face, -face, because we do have an office here in San Antonio. We could either come to the model home here, or you could come to our office. We, are, we office out of the um, Elion building there by La Cantera. But at that point, ever since uh, COVID hit, we've adjusted our ways of doing business. Uh, time is very, it's very precious and we respect the time of all our clients. So we have developed a process of being able to share our screen through virtual meetings and that makes it up very effective. We describe that process like if you were to be sitting right next to me because at that point, you're able to log in wherever you may be at the comfort of your home or if you have uh, a lunch break or at that point, everybody has busy schedules. You're able to log in, we're able to share a screen, and at that point, you're able to see all those modifications being done right then and there. So it, you don't have to be in person with us. We do have clients that say, well, I wanna be there. Not a problem. But at that point, like I've explained to our, our, a lot of our clients, the amount of time it's gonna take you to get to my office, it's the same amount of time it's gonna take me to do that meeting for you. So I can save you that time to come on over that driving time, especially how traffic is. We're able to save you all that time, you log in, and it's the exact same experience, but at that point, the only difference is that you'll be actually able to see the screen with all the changes being done. But thank you, that's a very good point. And that's a good point, too, because, I mean, seeing these things happen in real time, I can promise you that's, that's not a common practice. You know, uh, I've worked with a lot of designers, and, and typically the scenario is, is we sit down, we submit, everything's done via email, uh, you know, and it, it takes you know a couple of weeks for these things to come back. With these guys, the beauty of it is, is we're doing everything on the spot. That's just that doesn't happen. So I'm wondering what this is going to look like. You know, two weeks down the road, we know right then and there, and we understand that time is money. So the more time we're able to buy the design by coupling with folks like Adam and Sergio, the better it helps the process in all the long run. I mean, uh, our goal is to get you to the house as soon as possible, and, and there's steps toward achieving that overall goal for the floor plan for a while. And one of the things is that uh, that's a good point right there that we like to do weekly meetings with our clients because that allows us to be able to move forward on the process. And the way we work with our, with our projects is that uh, we always, at the end of each meeting, we always schedule the follow-up meeting. And at the follow-up meeting, we're good about giving expectations. So we'll tell you, you know, in this meeting, we're going to be going over this part of the project. And at that point, we give the clients ample time to review the project. And that same thing goes for before the meeting as well. So let's say that, for example, we're done with phase one and we're moving on to phase number two, which we're gonna explain right now. Between those phases, we're, develop we're transitioning from a 2D plan to a 3D setting. So the last thing we wanna do is send you something the day of, and you're like, well, this is all catching me by surprise. I haven't had a chance to review it. I'm not ready to do any changes because I haven't had a chance to really study my plan. We're real good about always making sure that any meeting that we have is productive. Because that's what we want. We don't want to waste your time. We want to make sure that we, the time that we're going to be spending on the plans is to help you 
progress and move forward. So we're real good about always sending you, what, if we're gonna have a meeting and at that point, it's not something that was done in real time, which I said, everything's done in real time, but when we're doing in between those two phases, we make sure that we send you that 3D model days before. That way you have a chance to fully review it, study it, and when we get into that meeting, we go straight into the modifications they want to get done. Well, right now, what I'll do is that I'm gonna switch it over to Mr. Adam. He's gonna go ahead and explain what our phase two, and we're gonna give you a visual of how that phase two looks as well. Hi, I'm Adam. So, Hi, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what Sergio was mentioned to is re it's really interactive because you get to see the changes uh, in real time in 2D. And, and like uh, we were mentioning, not a lot of firms do that. They don't take the time um, maybe they don't want to be under the gun or the pressure to be able to do those changes or kind of think during that meeting quickly. But uh, the experience that we have allows us to do that. We've been doing this for many years. So it's really interactive in the 2D. But this right here, this is uh, always an eye catcher because you get to see the house in 3D format. And we also do the changes live in, in 3D when uh, we, we come to this point. So you would get something like this uh, in an app and you can open it up on your tablet. Before, before the meeting, uh, days before, and you would be able to look at it, interact, go around the house like Sergio's doing it. You could even go inside the house and look at it. We place furniture. It's, base, it's more of like space plan, so you can be able to see you know, what size of bed, if you want a king size, queen size bed in there, uh, what fits in, in that room, uh, nightstands and things like that. And we're not any interior designers by any means, but we just put you know, things that typically will go into the house, so the table's gonna be a certain size, we put the table, that size, and you're able to go inside and see what the windows are gonna look like. It, it, it gets really interactive, especially once you start doing changes because we'll start uh, adjusting the roof pitches, adjusting the windows, and this is where we really tackle the windows and what it's gonna look like from the inside and outside uh, in the 3D model. Once the 3D model starts getting more progress in it, you'll be able to see uh, even the electric will start popping up in it. But for the main part on um, phase two, we, we start tackling the 3D model, uh, colors on the outside, if you know what kind of material ahead of time, like if you're gonna have a gallop balloon, a roof, uh, a colored roof, the fascia, uh, if you're gonna have the, a certain areas. So we might present it on a first meeting, all stucco or whatever concept picture that you provided to us. But then once we are here, we can easily change the materials, even the type of stone, if you want like a lighter white or a brick or something else, just kind of see what it looks like. Easily, it can be done during the meeting. I think it's gonna change some of the stuff. A Texas cream. Yeah, so, so it gets really interactive. And like we mentioned, we send this to you. You're able to receive it on your tablet. You're able to take off the roof, go inside each room. The only thing that we will not adjust is like the colors on the inside because then we'll spend like months working on, that's more of something that the interior designer or you start doing it when you do your selections. But if you know the outside, want to make sure that the outside of the house, you know, really comes to life, and you kind of feel, you know, this is my house. It's just, I'll reiterate how valuable that is. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is just—it's not common to be able to visually walk your house at this stage in the game because we've all we built houses before. You know, we understand. You get to a certain point where you're like, oh man, I wish I would have done that a little different. I wish I would have made this space a little wider, or the doorway, hallway, whatever it is. When we're able to physically walk, virtually walk the house at this stage in the game, that, I mean, that just sets you up for success. I mean, there's nothing you're going to change at that, at that point in the game because you are so confident with what we've set out and what we've done here. Uh, the current house that they're showing you is actually a red club my model. Um, these clients came in, fell in love with my model, but they're not in the Cordillera area. We just made minor tweaks. And um, now we know exactly where we're moving forward. They're at frame, what this thing's going to look like. They're confidently, you know, seen this and, and no window counts, no window sizes, um, hallways, room dimension, all of those things. It's one thing to see it on paper, but when you're able to virtually walk through the home at this stage in the game, it's super valuable. Right now, he just did some changes. He took off the sliding door. Mm -hmm. He moved the, the French doors over to one side, and then he added different type of windows. He added the window placements differently. Yeah. So it's things like that that you can do. We can, you know, put transoms above. We can do all sorts of changes during the meeting, height changes, adjust the pitch. Um, you know, I've even had clients during the meeting say, you know what, uh, now that I'm looking at it, that's not the kind of the style that I'm looking for. And, you know, we start adjusting yeah. it based on another picture that they might have uh, during that meeting. 
But I mean, it gets really, really interactive. I mean, it, it like uh, White Rose Machine. Uh, I don't know of any other firm that does any type of work like this that we're able to give the client the changes on demand. So uh, phase two consists of us going through this. At this point, we have overall 360 views of the, of the house. We have roof plan. Uh, all the windows are noted on this program. Once we go into here, this is what we actually use to finalize the plan. Um, could you show them the floor plan uh, with, the, with the dimensions, I mean with the note, noted plan? Yes. Uh, the, the, the prices at or the, the, the noted plan there. See, so those windows, if we do any type of change, you see that win those windows in the back area? He changed those windows right now, changed all that. That all got automatically adjusted on the floor plan. This is the plan that we would be turning in that has all the window sizes, door sizes. So it's a smart program. It automatically adjusts as we start adjusting it. It, it uh, eliminates uh, a lot of human error. Uh, I remember when I started, we, everything was in CAD. Everything was in 2D. So if you did a floor plan change and if the designer forgot to change it on the elevations, it did not get changed. So when they were building out there, they were like, which they would, they would get a call and be like, which one is it? The correct one. So in this case, the elevations change, the floor plan change as well, and everything starts getting updated. I mean, it, it's really uh, helpful. And then if you want to show them the, so once we have this plan, we have about an 80% uh, plan set. And we have a bank set that we can submit to Ryder. Ryder starts pricing it out. And we have an actual example of this. So after that meeting, after you do all your window changes, after we go through ceiling designs, once we get into this, this part, I, I tell the client, you know, I'm gonna give you a little bit of homework. You know, give me some ceiling designs. If you want it with beams, things like that, we can start adding this. And that way when Ryder gets the bank set, he already has all that information on the plans themselves. So we have the site plan. Uh, and if there is any topography, we'll show it any trees on there. It'll be shown on there. If it's a flat piece of land, it, it will show that. Then we have uh, the dimensional plan. The dimensional plan has all the window locations, uh, all the uh, center to the doors, everything that's needed for the framing. Then we have the noted plan. The noted plan here shows uh, ceiling heights, if there's any ceiling designs, if there's any uh, transom windows, uh, special appliances that need to be added on there. Then all that is noted on this plan and our square footages. Then we go into the elevations, the elevations. Like I said, this is a, this is a pricing set. This is what Ryder gets to be able to start pricing out the house. We have the, the uh, notations of the outside materials, uh, heights, plate heights, and, and call outs of different uh, type of material uses on the outside. And then we give some perspectives of the in 3D, which these are not the final renderings of the plans. Those come after we get the approval, but you've already seen the 3D model, and the, the renderings are a lot more realistic. Then we have the roof plan, and the roof plan has all the different uh, type of pitches on there, noted on the plan and then on our site notes as well, and a perspective of the uh, 3D of the roof. Then we have our framing plan. The framing plan, the, autom the, the program automatically puts the, uh, the rafters at uh, 24 inches on center, and it, it automatically, does, it's, a, it's a starting point for the engineer, uh, but it's just, like I said, it's a smart program, so it, it does uh, account for all the studs and all that. Then the, we have our typical notes. That's just uh, something cities or counties ask for, which is the basic. From there, you can you know, upgrade to spray insulation, anything you do in your contract. Then we have our electrical plan. On the electrical plan, we do everything from switches, lights, plugs, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors. If there's any type of special plugs that you want on there, like if, you're gonna, if you have an electric car, like a Tesla, or uh, I know even the Jeeps now have uh, their, their smart, they have the, the 220 uh, connection. Uh, we can go ahead and note that any landscaping uh, junction boxes that you want, there any screen plugs. If you ever, if you do a screen patio, we account for those plugs on, on the patio itself as well. Floor plugs. So those are special requests that are that you know that we'll put into the plan if those are something that you want in your house. The only thing that's not on there is a speaker system and alarm system. Those would be with like the low voltage. Yeah, we'll do that on the floor. Yeah. So that's that's our electrical plan. Then we have our cabinetry. Our cabinetry, we try to get as detailed as possible. Um, I know that there's a visit with the cabinet maker to mm -hmm. finalize the cabinets, but we try to get them as close as possible if they're going to be double stacked, 
you know, that affects the, the pricing. So we want to make sure we have as much detail as we can on, on those cabinets as well. And then that's just a cross section. That one just cuts through the house. It's just some subdivisions ask for that. So that, that's, that's a pretty almost uh, 80 to 90 percent uh, plant set that, that's given to a writer. After this plant set, if there's any additional, that's when we get into change orders. If there's something like it comes back and you say, you know what, we want to remove a whole room. Well, it's a lot easier to do a change order on the plan than do it out in the field. So it, that's something that we also go back and we can adjust the plan if needed um, at that point. But that's a, a phase two in a nutshell. I don't know if you all have any questions about our phase two. Yeah, and one of the interesting things that we mentioned is that you get it on your phone, on your tablet, phone, you can, you're able to open it up and you're able to go inside. Uh, I had a client that I was working with and the, the windows were, she had a certain area and it was a large wall and there was actually two rooms on that wall. So she wanted the windows to be, all three windows to be centered on the outside, but there was a wall between two of the windows. So she wanted to see what it looked like from the inside because her, her preference was for them to be centered on the outside. So obviously on the inside, they were not going to be centered. So we went, they, they were centered in one of the rooms, but on the other room, which was a utility room, there was two windows and they were a little slightly off to the side. In the program, we were able to go inside and show what it looked like before. So it's not something that's going to catch her by surprise in the construction, or she could make that adjustment if she needed on the plant. But th that's the interesting, interesting thing about this, this uh, this process, you're able to go inside and actually look at it from the inside and outside. Yeah, of course, use a 3D model, uh, especially in today's world where so many people are coming from out of state. Mm -hmm. They're not constantly having to fly back and forth. Right. You can just have the virtual meeting and the show them these plans and y'all can work with them like they're yes. right in the same room with you. So I commend you guys for doing the 3D plan mm -hmm. because that being able to see something is uh, so valuable to people as they're getting a the house built. Yes, definitely. And, 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 and to add on to that, sometimes the clients say, well, it's because it's, it's not to scale. Well, it's not to scale because we're seeing it on, on a TV screen or on, on our computer screen, but uh, I, we have actual little uh, uh, silhouettes of people. And if you tell me, okay, I'm six feet tall or however tall you are, we go ahead and put it in there and you can actually see the difference in the height of the cabinets and everything else. So they That's can, awesome. Yeah. So it makes it really interactive. <laughs> All right, so after this, after this gets approved, the 3D model, you're able to see the outside, you have your pricing set, we go to finalization, and Sergio can take us into the finalization. All right. Thank you, Adam. So the one thing that I wanted to note was that the, uh, the app, if any, anybody has questions, we have an example, we can show you how it works on, the, on your, like an, uh, an iPad or on your smart device. We have one that we can show you after the meeting. But any changes that are done to the plan, after the plan, after we've done that meeting, for example, in the phase two, we upload all the changes to the application, meaning that you don't have to wait for us to meet with you to have access to that, to your 3D model. Through the free app, you're able to do all, you're able to do everything I showed you right now, minus doing any modifications. So you're, you have access to that throughout the process. So it's not like you have to wait to the very end or for the meeting to see that 3D model. You have that access throughout the whole process. Even after, during the construction, because the construction, like, well, you're walking it through, you're like, well, how's this gonna look like? You bust out the app and you're there, you can see that, like, okay, this is how, this is how the, final, the final product's gonna look like. Because when you're seeing a stick home and you start going up, especially on a foundation, because sometimes the foundations, it, 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 it messes with your mind, because if you're going to a new construction, you're like, man, this looks too small. But when you're walking with the app and you start doing your own walk, you're like, okay, this is how I'm standing here in my bedroom. 
and you can do your little walkthrough there with your application. So again, you have access to that throughout the whole process, and it's in real time. So as we develop it, that application gets all the changes done. Okay, so that was uh, phase two, and uh, Adam did an awesome job, thank you. So we're gonna move on to phase three. Our phase three is basically just a continuation of the phase two. Now, like how Adam mentioned, we could easily jump to a phase three right, right off the bat, our phase three's final plans. But what we like to do is that we like to make sure that the clients are fully aware of what their, of what the construction cost is gonna be. Because the house could be as beautiful as it could be, but it could easily be out of budget. So the only way we're gonna be able to find out to within budget is if at the end of phase two, we give that a good set of pricing set over to the builder so that way they can start building, bidding that, that project out. So the last thing we wanna do is again, finish a set of drawings that you have to come back and we have to redesign. We don't wanna do double work and we don't wanna waste y'all's time either. Cause again, I was mentioned, mortgage rates are fluctuating. So as much as they're high right now, they can go low. So if we're able to, on a fixed rate, the faster the better, and have you all the tools available to you to make that decision to say, you know what, I'm comfortable with this plan, then that's how we're gonna do it. And that's what this process has allowed us to do that. So once we get your, let's say we get your green light, you're like, okay, the price came back, it's within budget, we like the design, we like the price, let's go ahead and go with a full-blown set, a construction set of drawings. And that's what you're getting here. That's when we go ahead and put that 3D model that we saw into another software that we use, and this is our photorealistic rendering software. So at this point, if there's certain colors that you want to, because certain subdivisions are very picky. And this one was built in Cordier Ranch, and they're, <laughs> they're extremely picky in that subdivision. So these tools allow the, the HOA to be able to speed up the approval process. So we're able to show them a 3D rendering of how the colors are gonna be for the roof, a photorealistic view of how the, the stone colors are gonna look, and also the stucco. So at that point, you're able to make those selections prior to finishing the plan, and we're able to give you a good presentation how those colors come together, and also gives the HOA a very good idea what their final product is gonna look like. Because if it looks nice here on paper, I mean, Casa Domingo does a beautiful job in making them even look more beautiful once it's already constructed. That's, that's always the goal. So again, this is our cover page. We have that 3D rendering. We have the area tabulation box, which we've been annotating and modifying as we progress the plan. So it just shows the square footages. The construction analysis is just a brief breakdown of what the construction consists of. If it's stone, if it's brick, metal roof, if it's tile roof, it just gives a little minor breakdown of what the construction consists of. So that's our cover page. Moving on to the second page, this is where we have our final site plan. Again, this subdivision, every subdivision is a little different. This subdivision requires a lot of notes. They're wanting a lot of detail regarding a silt fences. They want to know uh, a construction fence to be put on there. So at that point, this page varies on the amount of information needed based on the HOA that you're going into. But generally, what we put in there is we want to square off the, the property, uh, the, the, the house on the property, so that way it's easier for the foundation gentlemen, or when they're sticking out the corners, they know where to start, and that, at that point they can start squaring off the house. And this, up, in this page, we also annotate how much driveway we have. So we put there the total concrete of driveway, so that makes it easier to get a, a proper bid, or the final construction cost in that as well. So this is our site plan. Again, we show trees, we're showing topography because that was provided to us when we were first developing the plants. So that's part of the site plan. Again, it's just a little bit more detailed than what we provided in phase two, but this is already ready for you so they can start constructing the home. Moving on to the next page, again, we already provided a dimensional plan to the contractor by now, but this just gives even more, more dimensions. This is very important because the last thing we want is that we don't want the framers or any subcontractors on site because I've seen it, in other, not, not with Casa Domain, but in other builders, they get it, a ruler and they're like more or less like figuring out more or less what the measurements are. We don't want that. So the more information we have on, on the plants, the less amount of guesswork that is going to be on the field. So here we dimension to the centers and we have a pocket door. We dimension 
where it's going to start, how wide it is, so that way the framer is pointed in there. They're not going to mess up because at that point, if they put it too much to the corner, that could affect the trim. That could affect how we're going to put our, our, our light switches. So the last thing we want is it's already there. They're already putting the finishing touches and we don't have enough space for all those little details. So we think about those things while we're finishing the plans and that's how we annotate everything as, as much as we can on the, on the blueprints. Now, one thing you notice, this is just a dimensional plan. We don't have any annotations. We want the plan to be as clean as possible so that way it's easy to read. So there's nothing that's hiding or overlapping something on the blueprints. So that's our dimensional plan. The, yeah. fo the following page. We actually have several pages oh, yeah. so big. It's a big house, so when this happens, we like doing blow-ups. Again, we don't want uh, them to be guessing out there, oh, they're too small, the numbers are too small to read. So if that's the case, we do do blow-ups, enlargements, so that way they're easy to read on the blueprints. Here we have our annotated plan. So this how Adam explained our phase two. Our annotated plan, we annotate all the heights. If we have cathedral scenes, we tell them, okay, it's gonna start at this point, let's say at 17, at the middle is gonna go up to 20. So that way the framer knows, okay, this is what we're gonna do. And that's very important, and that's one thing that the program allows us to figure out. Because one of the common mistakes that we see on the field is that, again, we want it to look beautiful, we want it to look grand, but there's a lot of things that go behind that. For example, how we're gonna get the AC, the AC ducts gonna go from one side to the other house, to the other side, if this thing is open all the way. There's no way to get those AC ducts to the opposite side. At that point, you're gonna be forced to put another AC unit, and AC units are not cheap, they're expensive. So if we're able to catch on to those little things using the 3D model, and one thing that uh, Adam mentioned was the framing plan, not the cut sections, for example, in this one, this one, if you notice, the, the living room has that little, that little cathedral scene going on, but we, oh, we, allowed a, um, we allowed a cross space, which is that space right there, that, that space right there that allows us to run all the AC unit, all the plumbing, from, so that way we're allowed to go to the opposite side of the home. Now, this is a technical part, but while we're doing our space to review, when we go room by room through all the windows and all the cabinetry, we're explaining these things to you. So it's not gonna come as a surprise. And we let you know, you know what, we let this space here, and then we were able to go into the 3D model and physically show you, you know what, this is where the space is at. And that way you already know that we're leaving that there for that very reason. So again, planning out issues so that way when we're in construction, the last thing we want to do is get that cost to go up because it was a de design flaw. And again, we're not, we're not in a perfect world, so we wish we could be, the plans could be perfect, but our, our goal is to strive to where they're as close to perfection as possible to avoid additional cost at the end. So we'll go back to the NOTA plan. This is just an example of little issues that we're able to, uh, to fix. But our NOTA plan, again, all the doors, all the windows are there. We annotate also, if you notice, for example, underneath all the windows, there is a measurement. So we're actually telling the framer already, you know what, this window on the dimensional plan, I'm giving them, this is where it goes in the middle, this is the center. But I'm also annotating to them, this is the header height. Because the last thing we want is for them to be guessing. An example here, this is a very uniform house, right? So when we start building this, the framer, we want to make sure that the, that window there is not below the header of this one, because not, you start looking at, when it's built, you start seeing lopsidedness. So we want to make sure that everything is uniform, so we annotate to the framer exactly the location and also the heights where they start. So again, avoiding any guessing work, the more information, the better for them. But again, this is an annotated plan. The next page, <clears throat> we move on to our, again, these are enlargements, again, of the same annotations. And then we go into our flat views. So all of our plans, especially our final plans, everything is in color. Black and white, we could do it, but it's kind of hard to distinguish materials and textures. So even our flat views, we put them in color, and those colors are reflecting the colors that you all chose which are the final selections on the stucco, the, the stone type, the metal roof type, all that's already reflected here as well. And again, we annotate the, in this case, the subdivision wanted to know percentages of, because some subdivisions want to know how much percentage every single wall has of stone and stucco, because some of them have rules 
pertaining to that. So we'll do our investigation. So when we start that design process, we always ask the clients, hey, give me the HOA guidelines. And we start, okay, they're gonna be asking for this. So that when we get to the final plans, we already start showing those details on the blueprints. Getting ahead of it, because the last thing we want is for them to review, send it back, wasting time. I mean, if we're able to put it in there at the beginning, it's always best. So here it shows percentages. We also give different views of the renderings. So instead of you seeing just a flat view, we have different angles and that final photorealistic rendering as well. This right here, um, also topography. So at that point, by now, we've already done our final site evaluation, meaning that the contractor's already provided me exactly how much we're going to show or how much we're gonna either cut into the, the land or how much we're gonna have, how much exposure of the foundations we're gonna have. So for example, we could start at 18 inches on one side and end up with a three foot or eight foot drop. So at that point, we're able to give you a good visualization showing our final, our zero grade level, but it lets you know exactly how that's gonna look like at the end. And that's just showing, again, going back to cost, be able to visualize it and also for the HOA to approve it because some of them are a little bit picky on how much concrete is exposed. Because if you've seen some houses where the concrete is like eight feet, so some are like, no, we don't want that much exposure. That needs to be painted either stuccoed or if we're only gonna allow a certain percentage. So again, we're able to show that here as well. Yeah, that particular neighborhood is 18 inches on grade. That's why you see it, the way it's represented in that, that first elevation on page nine, where you see all your materials coming down to what the requirement is of being 18 inches on grade. So when we're looking at approvals, that's super valuable because we don't want to go back to the drawing board at any time if we don't have to. Uh, same thing like you refer to the Mason. You know, we have certain percentages. Every one of these neighborhoods has a certain percentage that you have to meet. So getting all those things at the stage in the game just because you're gonna have a typical approval process be it and visualizing the structure to be put together. Again, we're already thinking about issues regarding AEC ducts. We're talking about uh, making sure that certain we're not gonna have any problems with roof, with, with water. Um, so at that point the tools that we use, especially with the 3D, allows us to be able to visualize and foresee any issues and correct those issues during the design process. So again, this right here, and how Adam mentioned, the plans are a direct reflection of the 3D model. So it's not like the 3D model is separate from the plans. They're, they're tied together. Any changes we do to the 3D model, automatically is updating these final documents at that point. So this is the framing plan. This page is just a typical detail page that's provided for the county or the city. It just gives minimum requirements regarding installation values and again, what the construction is going to consist of. And then we have the electrical. Uh, Adam mentioned he was real detailed about that. We go over all the electrical, especially for example, floor plugs. That's one of the main things. Once the foundation is done, it's not like you could go ahead and break the foundation anymore. So we think about Okay, in the 3D model, we placed out the furniture more or less where it's gonna go. Let's go ahead and plan out a floor plug here because that's where either we're gonna have a sofa that's gonna recline or we're gonna put a, a, a decorative uh, end table. We wanna make sure that we have the power for that. Last thing we want is running a cord across the living room. All that's thought out in the electrical plan. Next one is just the cabinets. Again, how Adam mentioned the cabinet views. We don't go into major details on the cabinets, but we do give you where they're gonna be placed at. And again, these cabinet views are a reflection of whatever shows on the 3D. So when the 3D shows a certain cabinet, it's just it's being reflected here at that point. And then the final page, uh, these are more cabinet views, are, are, are typical uh, just cut sections for the framing at that point. So in a nutshell, that is what a final set of drawings consists of. And we kind of already went over the, our phase one, our phase two, and our phase three. Phase three is more direct because at that point we, we should have already done all the changes prior to finalizing the plans. And again, at this point, the whole, our whole point of, of uh, using these phases and developing it was to make the process fun for the clients. Because before when we had the, in 2D, it, it, it was like we were like marriage counselors at one point because <laughs> we'll have the wife and, and they're like, what do you think? I'm like, hey, uh, I, I, I'm just here to design. I'm not here to, <laughs> to get into those issues. But at that point, this process has made the process, the design part, fun for the clients. 
Because they're able to see it and they're able to see the changes. So instead of it had being stressed out and be like, well, I'm not fully visualizing what I'm getting, the product allows us to be able to give you that peace of mind that like, you know what, it was thought out, it's exactly what I had in mind. At this point, it's just getting it built at that point. So I mean, that's phase three. Do you have any questions regarding that part? What you mentioned about it being fun, uh, I've had I've been in meetings where the client says that there's a certain wall and they're going to put like a deer head. Well, I have deer heads in my program. Sometimes I put a deer or a moose or some kind of animal in the room, and they're like, "Oh, it, that's, it fits perfect. That's that's the size." Or I had a client that had like an, an elk. I think it's an elk. It's a, it, it was huge, so I had to make it the size and I put it there so you could kind of visualize the space that he had on that wall for that. So I mean, it does get really fun. When we're working on these plans. Yeah. One last thing we're going to show you right now is a, a little, this house right here, this is like a, a brief video of what we're able to, what the program allows me to do. So you're able to see a very good idea of 360 views or whatever that, which is an example of this one right now. We'll be providing this video over to, to Ryder, so you can maybe post it or oh, yeah. share it. Yeah. I know my uh, courtier clients are going Again, we're not landscape architects either, but we like to make it look as real as possible. And we'll, we'll let it play. There's a few houses that are on there as well. Some other houses that we worked with right here. Yeah. So any questions or any concerns or? Do you have the capability to show that with the topography? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So funny story, uh, when I was building before I met Roger Costa May, uh, I went out and they were really rough and plumbing. And I roll up and there's a stringer line from the left to the right. My house is 110 feet wide. And so I'm looking at that line and it looks like this. And I'm like, I get out and I'm like, that's not level. The plumber's like, oh, it's level. I'm like, well, that's not level. He's like, Chris, it's level. He gets to level. He's like, see? I'm like, you know, I'm now going to call my wife, right? Because this is not going to go well. <laughs> so we figured out a way to have ways to hide that foundation. And you're just looking without me. I would build another house just after that, but my wife said, no. Um, but uh, that would set expectation where it looked like two foot drop, right? No, we're seven foot drop, left to right on there. So that's super powerful. Yeah, so the, that's a very good point, and I forgot to mention that. So on our phase two, when we go to the 3D model, and we have the topography already, especially we already have the set evaluation, how much exposure. The program allows me to already show the topography on the 3D model. So you get to see how everything goes. You don't have to wait until this step to see that. You'll be able to see that even before we even get to pricing. So the, the program does allow us to do that. So yeah, thank you for bringing that part up. Because then when you start, I didn't talk about pools and you know, landscape and all those things, when you start trying to lay that out, that gives you a much better design of where you're going to put those things, run off the water, right now, when we look at financing for pools, barns, fences, landscape, if riders do it, obviously it goes in, right? If it's a pool and you're going to contract that, there's you can either roll that in and we can do two liens under the construction loan or, depending upon, you can pay cash for it. There's reasons you would do it one or the other, um, but those are questions I get all the time about the peripheral stuff too, so. So yeah, so at the end, we'll be able to show the photorealistic on the, on the topography. And again, there's a lot of subdivisions, especially Cordillera, <laughs> that wants us to show that topography. So again, we're used to working with all types, but again, the whole point here is, is not really to satisfy the HOA, is to make sure that you all get a chance to fully get a very good grasp of what's going to look like. To avoid those type of issues. Once you see there, like, what, I got like a 10 foot exposure, like I, I couldn't see that. And we could easily, at that point, adjust it within the property or do adjustments to the floor plan to maybe put, bring it into the more flat area or to minimize that exposure. Like, we do different styles, so it's not just farmhouse, contemporary, uh, modern transitional, farmhouse. I mean, at that point, we can design anything you all want. Just, we use it to guide and inspiration things. Like, and yeah, this is just a, a little video that we, that we, that we put together for you all. So. If you have any questions, you can uh, approach me or Adam. Was there anything else I forgot? Nope. I think we're good I like to talk a lot. I know you guys don't like to talk too much. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and it's really not a problem. Well, we appreciate y'all's patience and I know it took me some time to get it, but uh, if there's anything, we'll be here around and if you want to see an example of how that it looks on the iPad, feel free to uh, to come up to us and we'll have it to show. Okay? Awesome. Thank you guys. Cool. Perfect. So no questions. We're all good. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. All right, that was a lot of information. I knew the video was gonna be a little bit long. Didn't know it was gonna be quite that long with the three different speakers that we had, but man, that was a lot of great information. I certainly learned a lot and I hope you did too. And if you did, of course I want you to hit that like button, subscribe to my channel. And I'm gonna have all those folks that you just heard, their contact information in the description box. So feel free to reach out to them with any questions you might have or just put them in the comments and I'll be happy to relay those questions to you. All right, that's gonna do it for today. Thanks for sticking around for this long, long video. All right, take care now, bye.